Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you for tuning in this week. Uh, this is episode uh, 100. Uh, seems crazy that we're there already. Uh, we're closing in on two years since we launched this podcast and show, so I appreciate all of you who've been listening from the beginning and all of our new listeners who are tuning in as well. We will uh, very soon here be moving to two episodes a week, so we'll be doubling the amount of uh, content we produce to cover people who are doing amazing work in the country and the world to protect the preborn and, and contend in the public square, um, as well as continue to cover uh, what is happening in America um, and how we think through the uh, worldview of choice, the complicity of Americans in the church on abortion, and what a game plan looks like to engage and wake up. So thank you guys for tuning in. We're really excited to be on episode 100. We have a special episode for you today. This was a live lecture that I gave at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, uh, just a couple weeks ago called Abortion is Genocide. And my Abortion is Genocide lecture tour was actually canceled when I was at UC Berkeley in the very beginning of the COVID shutdown. So I didn't get to give that at UC Berkeley, but I got to give it at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And I go through the five points of comparison between abortion and historically recognized forms of genocide and what all these things have in common, as well as some Q&A on the end. So I hope you enjoy this lecture. Give this show a rating and review. It really helps us reach more people. We are continuing to climb up the ratings and the show, so it appears to more people. And uh, maybe some of those moderates tune in and get equipped to have their minds changed and pro-life is encouraged to stand in the gap. So thank you so much. Enjoy this lecture and we will see you soon. Good evening, you guys. Thank you for coming out. Can you hear me okay? Perfect, perfect microphone. Thank you for everyone who put the time into making this event uh, work. And thank you guys for coming out. Um, while I understand the strange political season that we're in, if you would like, and this is not coming from the school, so I can't get in trouble. If you would like to wear your mask under your nose, I would be very happy to see your noses. I just flew out here, of course, and you know, I, I like put my jacket over my head and I take a nap so I can take my mask off on the plane and you can feel free to report me if you uh, think that's wrong. Well, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Uh, I just like to see as much of your facial expressions as possible uh, because we're human beings. We're embodied human beings. That's how we were created. And so I like to see your faces as much as I can. But I understand the moment that we're in. Thank you guys for coming out. Uh, my name is Seth Gruber. I've been speaking on the issue of abortion since I was 19 years old. I'm 29 now, just a, a few months shy of 30. And this is an issue that's very much been a part of my life. My mother was directing a pregnancy resource center while pregnant with me uh, and prior to being pregnant with me. And for pro-choice individuals who say, you know, oh yeah, those fake medical clinics, you mean, that lie to women with fake science and they're, they're just pro-birthers, right? They don't really care about the baby after it's born. Um, okay, yeah, well, my mother was housing pregnant women when they were pregnant who didn't have a place to live. And then she was babysitting the babies that she helped carry to term with the mothers that she encouraged to choose life when they were three or four years older because the girl didn't have a man in the picture who was supporting her and my mother would baby at the toddlers so that mom could go have a little time to herself. So this lie of the pro-life movement is just a pro-birther. We don't care about the babies after it's born. It's a bunch of uh, baloney, to use a polite term. So this is very much an issue I care deeply about and that um, has really become a moral stain on the soul of this republic in a very similar way that I think slavery was and that I think the Holocaust was in Germany. And that's the topic of tonight's lecture. It's called Abortion is Genocide. And we talked about a little bit this uh, afternoon with students on campus as we dialogued on this topic. And I know when I say that, it sounds very strange to people who are pro-choice, who disagree with us. It actually sounds strange to some people who identify as pro-life but they've never thought deeply about the issue. Or maybe you know people who say they're personally pro-life, you know, they, they say, I wouldn't get an abortion, I wouldn't pressure someone else to get an abortion, but you know, it should, it should remain legal. Who am I to impose my moral beliefs on others? Many pro-life individuals think that it's offensive to use this type of language. So I wanna make a case as to why. In 1941, Winston Churchill called it a crime without a name. In 1944, Raphael Lemkin gave it a name and he actually coined the word that we use today. Genocide. In 1948, the United Nations actually gave it its first legal definition, and this is what it was. Genocide means any acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, 
racial, or religious group. Several years later, France went even further. And, and you'll find, if you study the history of genocide, you'll find many different definitions of genocide. Um, and I'm going to give you a reason as to why I think there are so many different definitions. Well, France went further, broadening the definition, stating genocide occurs where in the enforcement of a concerted plan aimed at the partial or total destruction of a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group or of any other group determined by any other arbitrary criterion. Interesting. So a shifting definition in France to account for the changing nature in which genocide was instituted in various cultures and in various contexts. Well, the Webster's New World Encyclopedia gave it a definition in 1992, a year after I was born, as this, the deliberate and systematic destruction of a national, religious, cultural, ethnic, or other group defined by the exterminators as undesirable. You know, there's a synonym for the word undesirable, unwanted. These broad definitions, and there are others, I just gave you a few of them, emphasize the evolving nature of the criteria by which victim classes are defined, you see. So genocide always entails the dehumanization, dehumanization of an entire class of human beings in order to justify their mistreatment or slaughter. And those who murdered Jews and blacks denied the personhood of their victims just as vehemently as practitioners of abortion deny the personhood of the unborn. Now, listen, I understand these are circumstantially different. OK, I'm not saying that abortion is the contextual and historical equivalent of slavery and the Holocaust. I'm saying while circumstantially different than slavery or the Holocaust, abortion is still a deadly repetition of history that utilizes the same tactics of dehumanization to justify the killing of those that the society or the elite class define as undesirable or unwanted. As my colleague Scott Klusendorf points out, and this is beautifully put, in the past, we used to discriminate on the basis of skin color and ethnicity and we still do at times. But today with elective abortion, we discriminate on the basis of size, level of development, location, and your dependency. You see, we simply swapped one form of bigotry for another, an evolving nature of the criterion by which victim classes are dehumanized. Now, listen, I want to make a goodwill statement here. I'm not suggesting that women who have had abortion are practitioners of genocide. And I agree that suggesting that abortion is genocide is ludicrous and offensive and stupid if the unborn is not a human being. If the unborn is not a human being, then me contending that abortion is genocide is asinine. And you should call me a bigot and a Republican rube. But if the unborn is wholly human, then they are simply discriminated against with a new woke criteria in order to justify their mistreatment and slaughter. Now, of course, I'll contend and argue that the practitioners of genocide are abortionists, those who kill the unborn, and those who work within the abortion industry and the pro-abortion movement, whose entire goal is to protect a woman's fictional constitutional right to schedule the death of her own unborn offspring, who in 99% or more of cases, she, she created consensually. I'd say the practitioners of genocide are the pro-abortion movement and the abortionists themselves. But all of this is ludicrous and stupid if the unborn is not a human being, I agree. So what is the unborn? You see, this is the fundamental question in the issue of abortion, isn't it? And it's the one question that pro-abortion advocates tend to avoid like wildfire. Let me explain to you why this question really trumps all other considerations in the abortion debate. I want you to imagine for a second that uh, if you're a college student, you've uh, met the man or woman of your dreams. Maybe you already have. You've gotten married. You had a couple of kids and you have a little town home here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, one evening as you're standing at your kitchen sink cleaning dishes because God hasn't blessed you with the dishwasher. God forbid. Your three year old toddler walks up behind you. OK, your back is turned and little Timmy says, mommy or daddy, can I kill this? Now, you know, little boys ask that question a lot, but your back is turned. So what would be the first question out of your mouth in response to your toddler's question? Can I kill this? Anyone? What is it? Kill what? I mean, right? Can't we agree as that? Regardless of whether we're pro-life or pro-choice, kill what? Because if you turn around and he's holding a cockroach, you know, dad says, you know, 
here, son, here's a hammer, squishy, squishy, don't tell mom. But if you turn around and he's holding the newborn neighbor kitty, you'd probably have a different reply. At least I hope so. <laughs> Maybe you're a vindictive cat hater, I don't know. But if you turn around and he was holding his newborn little sister by the throat, we have issues, right? You need counseling now. So you couldn't actually answer the question, can I kill this, until you first answered the question, what is it? Well, similarly, isn't it, isn't it entirely plausible to suggest that we can't answer the question, can we kill the unborn, <laughs> until we first answer the question, what is the unborn? And this question is the one that's avoided more than any other by those who advocate for abortion. As Greg Kokel, a friend of Rashu Christie and myself, Christian apologist, says that if the unborn are not human, well, then no justification for abortion is necessary right? If it's not a human, then get as many abortions as you'd like, whatever. It's no different than clipping your fingernails. I don't care. But then he says, however, if the unborn are human, no justification for abortion is adequate. You can't provide an adequate justification of the dismemberment or poisoning of an innocent human being if they're a human being. So let's answer this question before I make my case that abortion is genocide, because if I don't answer this question first, the whole lecture doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Well, what does the science of embryology teach? Listen, I'm not going to turn to the Bible to make my case that the unborn is human. And if you have a bone to pick with me over the status of the unborn, your bone is actually not with me. It's with the science of embryology, which has been very clear for literally decades. Not because I say so, not even necessarily because the biologists say so, but oftentimes even because the people who kill babies and defend abortion say so. Okay, so what does the science of embryology teach us? Embryology is a study of the embryo, right? What's an embryo? It's a human being at a very early stage in their physical development. Have you heard this saying uh, from pro-choice or sometimes they say, uh, you know, is, well, is an acorn an oak tree? Yeah, I didn't think so, pro-lifer. See, a fetus is not a person. Okay, well, an acorn would be the developmental genesis of an oak tree, just like a fetus is the human developmental developmental genesis of a human being. Saying acorn and tree is just like saying fetus and adult or toddler and adult. These are just different terms we use to describe the same human being at a very early stage in their physical development. So that's what the science of embryology is, a study of that embryo. And it's, it's not a dehumanizing term. Some pro-lifers say fetus and zygote embryo. These are dehumanizing terms. Yeah, the pro-abortion movement uses them as dehumanizing sometimes, but in and of themselves, they're just scientific. They're just words that describe a human being at a specific stage of their development. So I'm going to cite to you the science of embryology, and you'll find this language in pretty much any embryology textbook on pretty much any university campus in the country, except maybe UC Berkeley, right, <laughs> that just bans scientific facts that they don't like. So from the moment of conception, you, all human beings, were a distinct, living, and whole human being. That's the language you'll find in embryology textbooks. Distinct, living, and whole. Okay, what do those terms mean? Well, we all know what distinct means, right? It means unique, it means separate. Like you're distinct, there's only one of you. <laughs> That's how it was intended. And one of you will never exist again. You're entirely distinct. So the science says the child in the womb from conception is entirely distinct. Okay, well, then what does that mean as it's applied to the issue of abortion? It means that the body in her body is not her body. That's what that means. But what's the mantra we hear? My body, my choice. Well, that mantra assumes that how many bodies are involved? One, right? My body, my choice. That's the whole point. It's saying there's just my body. Is that true? No. According to the science, the child in your womb from conception is actually entirely distinct. And don't we know this from a self-evident level? Do we really want to admit, guys, that pregnant women have 20 fingers and 20 toes? Two brains, two hearts, two different DNA codes, potentially two different blood types existing simultaneously. Wow. Oh, and if she's pregnant with a boy, some of you had Starbucks on the way in, then pregnant women now have male genitalia, right? And then, of course, uh, the UC Berkeley professor says, yes, yes, men can be women and women can be men. Welcome to UC Berkeley. I mean, this is anti-scientific nonsense and bigotry. There are only two genders. Pregnant women do not have penises. Therefore, the unborn child is distinct. Secondly, the unborn child is living because, um, did you know dead things don't grow? And the unborn child meets all of the requirements for a living thing that we literally, lear literally learned in sixth grade biology. Lastly, did you know unborn children develop themselves from within? Now, I know this because I have a three-year-old and a four-month-old. Here's something that never happened. My wife never shook me, waking me up in the middle of the night saying, babe, wake up, wake up. Come whisper to my uterus. Come remind baby to grow. We don't want her to forget. She needs to remind 
be reminded to stay on her developmental progress. No, babies develop themselves from within, whether mom wants them to develop or not. So they're living. And lastly, you, from the moment of conception, were a whole human being. Now, this is probably the most important concept from the science that we've learned. So please don't confuse wholeness, this idea of being a whole human being, with having realized certain functions or capacities that come along with the level of development. Because we have this tendency to look at one another, right, and say, yeah, we're all whole human beings, right? We're aware of our own existence. We're conscious. We're self-aware, right? We have meaningful relationships. We have desires and all these things. We're whole human beings, right? And we, we tend to think that that's what it means to be a whole human being. That's not what wholeness means. A whole human being is one who already has everything they need to what? realize their full growth and development as a participating member of the human species, right? So is the unborn in the womb capable of math? No. Are they capable of even knowing that they exist yet? No. Are they capable of having certain desires? No, except when they try to pull away from the forceps that the mother paid the abortionist to murder them with. They have desires to not be torn apart, but they don't have other type of desires that we have. Does that mean they're not a whole human being? No, because they have everything they need to realize those functions. Just like some of your children, for the parents in the room, are not possessed of certain functions or capacities that they will be possessed of as teenagers, right? So did you know my wife recently found out that men don't reach their mental peak until their 40s? And she said, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. She's really holding out hope for me. I, I don't really know what that means. Maybe you can pray for me. But what my point is, is there's aspects of my mental development I have not realized. And by the way, I didn't just say that for a laugh. Like men do not reach their mental peak until their 40s. That's actually true, right? Should be very encouraging for those of us who have teenagers, right? So does that mean that we're not whole human beings now? No, no, that's not what that means, right? Here, here's another way to explain this. You guys remember those Polaroid cameras, right? They've, they've become cool and hip again. And you, you know what I'm doing. It spits a photo out as soon as you take it, and then you get the cool little Instagram hangers, right? And you hang up all your little arts and whatever. So imagine that you got to go on a safari excursion in Africa, and you get to see wildlife in its natural habitat, and you get to go with a bunch of your friends, you know. Okay. Well, all of you bring your digital cameras and your iPhone cameras, which are, you know, basically nicer than most digital cameras now. But one of you, you kick it old school, right? You have a flip phone and you have a Polaroid camera. Well, the uh, tour guide tells you on the intercom of this tricked out bus, you know, hey, we're entering an area where a black jaguar was sighted recently. That's yeah, pretty cool. And I don't know if you know this, but black jaguars are probably the least photographed animal in the world, except maybe, you know, one, once on the bottom of the ocean. They're the, very rarely photographed, very rarely seen. Very elusive beast, be kind of cool, right? After a few hours, no black jaguar, sunset, twilight, last few minutes of daylight, no jaguar. So all of you lose your patience and you turn on a TV show. You know? But the Polaroid camera guy or girl, he's more patient. She's more patient. You have your eyes glued to that window. And in that last few seconds of twilight to your luck, a black jaguar sprints out from the bushes, leaps across the path in front of your bus, and you capture a picture of him airborne. By the time he lands and the photo gets spit out, nobody else has seen him, but you have the photo. And you start jumping up and down saying, I got a picture of a black jaguar. What if at that point I reached over your right shoulder, I ripped the photo out of your hands, I tore it up into little pieces, and I threw it out the window? Would you be upset with me? I think so. What if I responded to your open mouth horror and I said, oh, brother, sister, chill out, dude. Because that actually was not a picture of a black jaguar. It was actually just a black smudgy on a white piece of paper. You probably respond to me by saying, Seth, what are you talking about? The jaguar was actually already there. We just couldn't see him yet. Everything that was necessary for that photo to realize its full development was already present when the photo got spit out. It just needed time. That's what I mean when I say that from the moment of conception, the science of embryology teaches that you were a distinct, living, and whole human being who already had everything you needed to realize your full growth and development as a participating member of the human species, even if we couldn't see you yet. You just needed time. That's what the science teaches, okay? Now, it's not just because I say so. Let me cite to you some embryologists, some professor of genetics, and some um, people who have defended abortion at an academic level for decades, okay? Keith L. Moore, in probably the most celebrated textbook on embryology called The Developing Human, Clinically Oriented Embryology, says this. Human development begins at fertilization, the process during which a male gamete or sperm unites with a female gamete or oocyte to form a single cell called a zygote. This highly specialized, titipotent cell marked the beginning of each of us as a unique individual. Not as a unique blob of tissue, as a unique individual. In the same textbook, he continues and says a zygote 
is the beginning of a new human being. Dr. Jeremy Leguin, a professor of genetics at the University of Descartes, says after fertilization has taken place, a new human being has come into being. And he really holds the feet of anti-science pro-choicers to the flame here. Listen to his language. It is no longer a matter of taste or opinion. This truth that you began at the moment of conception. He's saying this whole, ah, that's, just, that's not my truth. Okay, whatever. It's no longer a matter of opinion actually anymore. He's saying that this is illustrated. And he finishes saying each individual, or he says it is plain experimental evidence. Each individual has a very neat beginning at conception. Okay, what about Peter Singer? Anyone know that name? Peter Singer defends abortion through point of birth and up to one years old, meaning 12 months outside of the womb. Yes, Peter Singer defends infanticide. He has done so for decades. And he teaches at Princeton, I believe. Now, that position alone should have gotten him fired decades ago. And I would actually argue that professors who defend abortion should also be fired as ageists. We would never make room for racists to teach in American universities. But if you're an ageist and you discriminate against the unborn for being younger, somehow that's acceptable because that's the new woke religion or orthodoxy. Well, Peter Singer, and I'm citing him just because he's the most radical pro-abortion professor in the world. So he tells me and you as pro-lifers that we're right. Mm -hmm. In his book, Practical Ethics from 1993, here's what he says. Whether a being is a member of a given species is something that can be determined scientifically by an examination of the nature of the chromosomes in the cells of living organisms. In this sense, there is no doubt that from the first moments of its existence, an embryo conceived from human sperm and eggs is a human being. And lastly, Ann Feroidi. Ann Feroidi is the CEO of the largest independent abortion provider in the UK. Okay, so she's the Planned Parenthood president equivalent in the UK. Here's what she said in a 2008 debate, and I quote verbatim. And I have all of these citations for you if anyone disagrees with me and says, you're just citing fake science. Here's what she had to say. We can accept that the embryo is a living thing. In the fact that it has a beating heart, that it has its own genetic system within it, it's clearly human in the sense that it's not a gerbil and we can recognize that it is human life. Okay, have I overstated my case? Probably. But the unborn is a human being because the science says so. If you're bone, if you have a bone to pick with me over the science, you actually have a bone to pick with reality. And that's who I'll argue who the left always seemingly has a bone to pick with. But you're probably not convinced yet, if you disagree with me, that abortion is in fact a genocide. Maybe you think that comparison just pushes the envelope a little too far. So how exactly is abortion genocide? Well, there are generally five points of comparison between various genocides, okay, of which abortion, I will illustrate, meets all of them. These similar points of comparison between historically recognized forms of genocide. Now, of course, abortion is not historically recognized as a form of gen uh, genocide by large swaths of the American public, but I'm going to make a case as to why I believe they should. The first point of comparison, and I'll probably spend the longest on this one and then fly through the others, is actually the most important because it's actually the most dangerous. It's the most dangerous element of genocide. And that point of comparison is the denial of personhood status. This is the most dangerous element of any genocide, is to look at people who we know are human beings and go, hey, they're not persons, though. By the way, anytime someone tells you that the unborn is a human but not a person, I want you to ask them, what's the difference between a human and a person? And then I want you to ask them, um, have you ever met a human that's not a person? Because I haven't, and I'm just wondering what they look like. Can you show me a picture of a human non-person? Well, that pro-choice would probably take you with Marty McFly in a time machine back to 1850s America with a bunch of registered Democrats and, oh, yes, and say, look at all these human non-persons. Oops. It's the same ideology. Ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. And nowhere is that more true today than on the issue of abortion. So let me go through the points of comparison between this first point of comparison, the denial of personhood status, between slavery, the Holocaust, and abortion. Those are the genocides that I'm choosing to compare today. Dred Scott versus Sanford, a decision we're all familiar with, 1856, okay? Quote, a subordinate and inferior class of human beings who had been subjugated by the dominant race, end quote. Yes, that was from the mouths of American jurisprudists and uh, Supreme Court justices denying personhood to our black brothers and sisters. The Virginia Supreme Court in 1858 actually said, in the eyes of the law, the slave is not a person. Okay, you're familiar with our history. How about the Holocaust? The Hiskerich, the German Supreme Court, 
1936. The Hiskerich refuses to recognize Jews as persons in the legal sense. There you go. Abortion, same United States Supreme Court, 1973. Quote, the word person as used in the Constitution does not include the unborn. Now, you'll notice that pro-abortion advocates and pro-abortion jurists and justices never make or offer a substantive argument as to what traits are necessary in order to be a person. They just assume that the class in question that they want to mistreat or eliminate are not full persons. This is a logical fallacy called begging the question. And it's also why they refuse to answer the question, what is the unborn? except by saying it's part of the mother's body. Slavery, the Holocaust, and abortion all discriminate against human beings by putting greater importance on what the human entity looks like and how they function or operate rather than on what they actually are, which is what? Human beings. The only thing we have in common, a human nature. The pro-choice movement writ large today, did you know this? Acknowledges the humanity of the unborn. I don't meet very many pro-choicers today who will look me in the face and say, it's not a human. And sometimes they say that and they're just repeating, they're parroting talking points. And I go, well, what is it, an elephant? Are you aware of the law of biogenesis that states all living things reproduce after their own kind? And usually I'll get them to admit pretty quickly. I mean, okay, Seth, I mean, it's biologically human. Like it has human DNA. Okay, fine. But it's not like fully human. It's not like a person, right? And then that's when they admit what they really believe, which is the tactic of this first point of comparison, the, not the denial of personhood status. So it's very scary that the pro-choice movement will actually admit the humanity of the unborn and say, yeah, they're humans, but we don't care. We don't care that they're humans. We can kill them anyways. And they do this by grounding personhood and human value in acquired properties and functions rather than the human nature, right? So they say your right to live is based off of how you operate certain mental functions or cognitive functions or any new woke criteria they come up with. But they don't actually offer a case as to why those traits or functions are value giving in the first place. So what acquired properties do pro-choice individ individuals use to deny the unborn rights of personhood, right? So with slavery, what was it? What, what were the, the debauched, bigoted categories that they used to separate some humans from the class of personhood? Skin color and intellect, right? That was it. Racists said blacks have a different skin color and they're stupider. Now that was her horrifically wrong and bigoted, but that was their case. That was the number. Those were basically the two arguments they used: skin color and intellect. Well, in Germany, it was religion, ethnicity, dehumanizing portrayals, which we'll get to. But we all knew that these were human beings anyway. So today with abortion, it's just a new category. It's a new set of criteria by which they deny personhood to the unborn. Do you remember my definition of genocide? These various definitions reflect the reality and the ever-changing nature of the criterion by which victim classes are dehumanized. Because while every genocide results in the slaughter of innocents, not every genocide is justified with the same language, right? So with slavery, with skin color and intellect, today with abortion, it's size, level of development, environment and dependency. And this is summarizing the acronym SLED, if you want to remember the new functions and categories that pro-choicers say the unborn must meet if they're to be a person with rights. SLED, size, level of development, environment, and dependency. And here is the pro-life argument. The unborn differs from us in the same ways that we differ from one another. Just like blacks differed from one another in the same ways that white dif whites differed from blacks, right? Are all of our black brothers and sisters have the same exact shade of skin color? No. Do whites all have the same exact shade of skin color? No. Because skin color comes in what? Varying degrees. Just like intellect comes in varying degrees. So the problem with denying the personhood of the unborn by saying that they're smaller, less developed, in a different environment and more dependent is that we as born people differ from one another according to what? The same things, our size, our level of development, our environment, and the degree to which we're dependent or not dependent on others or other things. So there is no value giving difference between the embryos that we once were and the adults that we are today that would justify killing us in the womb. 
And those only differences are size, level of development, environment, and dependency. Here's the problem. If we don't ground human value in our common human nature, then we're left with a very dangerous philosophical worldview called functionalism or the performance view of persons. And this is largely the theological underpinnings of the religion of leftism. And it's always been the beliefs that have underpinned the positions of the practitioners of genocide. So what, what does this mean, this idea of functionalism? Well, functionalism says that your rights, your natural right to life, your right to not be unjustly treated by others, to be recognized as a full person before the eyes of the law, is purely dependent on which functions you have and how you perform, not on your human nature. And did you know this was the very worldview that Abraham Lincoln railed against? when he argued against the racists in the Democratic Party, namely the one he ran against for president, right? Stephen Douglas in 1860, he was a racist Democrat. But don't worry, he was actually personally opposed to slavery. Did you know this? Stephen Douglas, I would never buy a, a whip of slave. I would never do that. But I think other states should have the right to decide whether they do this. And let me actually quote verbatim his language. I support the right of each state to vote it up or down. Okay, so I'm not just dehumanizing him through my voice. That, that's his language. He's, he thinks each state, they should just be able to vote on whether they purchase human beings and treat them like cattle or not. But he was personally opposed to slavery, just like many personally pro-life people today who say abortion should remain legal, right? It's like saying, I would never beat my wife, but spousal abuse should remain legal. Well, if I believed that, I would be a degenerate and ought to not have any reins of political power, right? And I think everyone would agree with that, regardless of whether you're pro-life or pro-choice. So here's how Lincoln responded to the worldview of functionalism, the performance view of persons that says you're not valuable because of a human nature. You're not valuable or have a right to life because you're human. You're only valuable if you meet these criteria in how you function. Here is how Abraham Lincoln responded to this type of worldview in 1854. And we have this writing in a little parchment piece of paper that he called Fragments on Slavery. Fragments on slavery. And this was the type of reasoning he would actually employ in his famous debates with Stephen Douglas a few years later. Let me quote to you verbatim. Here's what Abraham Lincoln said. He was, he was sort of preparing for how he would debate racists. He said, you say A is white and B is black. Okay, very well. It is color then. The lighter having the right to enslave the darker? Hmm. Take care. By this rule, you are to be a slave to the first man you meet with a skin fairer than your own. Oops. Then Lincoln said, oh, but you say it is a, is a question of intellect. You, you say that whites are intellectually the superiors of blacks and therefore have the right to enslave them. Take care. By this rule, you are to be a slave to the first man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. Oops. And then he said, oh, but you say it is a question of interest. Okay, racist. And if you can make it your interest, you have the right to enslave another. Very well. And if he can make it in his interest, he has the right to enslave you. Oops. What is Abraham Lincoln pointing out? He's pointing out that racist arguments grounded rights and personhood in things that come in varying degrees, right? If we all held up our, our arms here tonight together next to one another, would we find the same shade of skin color? No, so skin color comes in varying degrees. Do we all have the same exact IQ? No, so intellect comes in varying degrees. Do we all have the same level of interest? No, unfortunately, there's a epidemic of depression right now in the country, right? More people, young people in California have killed themselves than have died from COVID. I don't know if you knew that. We have an epidemic of depression going on right now. So our suicidally depressed individuals whom we love, they don't have the same interest to go on living, do they? So they have a smaller degree of interest than we do. Can we kill them? No. Are you aware of the Buddhist's goal to reach, uh, what is it called? Nirvana? What does that mean? The eradication of desire. Hmm. So they wouldn't have an interest to go on living or certain desires that they would have eradicated. Can we kill Buddhists who have achieved nirvana? No. So it looks like interest comes in varying degrees. Do you see what Lincoln was saying? If you ground personhood and rights and things that come in varying degrees, what follows? Rights come in varying degrees. Therefore, the smartest and the palest of skin have the greatest rights. And everyone with a less degree of said capacity or function would be less valuable. You can say goodbye to human equality. Tuck it away with the tooth fairy. It no longer exists. If functionalism and the performance view of persons is an accurate description of reality. That is the problem with this first 
comparison between genocide, the denial of personhood status, by grounding personhood in things that come in varying degrees. For the unborn, what is that? Size, level of development, environment, and dependency. Yes, the unborn child is smaller, but I'm six foot three. If you're under six foot three, I guess you're not a person, right? And if I killed you, I, you know, actually, I think I'll just call it reproductive health care. Now, I know you don't understand that because you're not woke, so let me explain it to you. You see, in murdering you, I prevented you from reproducing, right? Because you're dead. So that's why I called it reproductive health care. What? Of course not. That's stupid and ridiculous. Why? Because rights are not based on size, are they? Rights are based on what? A human nature. When did that human nature begin? The moment of conception. What's the second woke function that pro-choicers use to justify killing the unborn? Level of development. Yes, the child's less developed. But your children are less developed than you. Your parents are more developed than you. In fact, grandparents are significantly more developed than their grandchildren, right? In fact, the difference in development between a grandchild and a grandparent is significantly greater than the difference of development between the fetus and the toddler. So can grandparents kill their grandchildren? Because grandparents are more developed. When I reach 40 and I've reached my mental peak, can I murder toddlers because they're not as developed? No, of course not. But the pro-choicer says, well, the unborn, and then they start coming up with functions, right? The unborn is not um, self-aware, conscious, able to feel pain, viable. They don't have desires. They start going through all of these categories, right? Well, did you know we now know from the most recent scientific studies that self-awareness doesn't occur until months after birth? So can we murder infants before that level of development? I don't think we like that. What do pro-choicers say? The uh, baby's not conscious. The unborn is not conscious, right? Right? Well, neither is your grandparent if they're on life support or in a coma. Neither are you when you're sleeping. Neither are you if, God forbid, you get knocked out in a fight and you're on the sidewalk. You're not conscious. All of these things come in varying degrees. And if we use them to justify killing the unborn, they can be used to justify killing born people. Just like Lincoln said, if you use these categories to justify enslaving the black, they work equally well to justify enslaving you, you white racist. What's the third category? Environment. Yes, the child is located in a womb. By the way, that's where we all came from, right? We're all former womb dwellers. That's why Ronald Reagan once said, I've noticed everyone who's for abortion has already been born. And our pro-choice friends go, hum, 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 what a stupid little pithy saying. It's actually funny. It's actually ironic. Here's why it's ironic. You sanction the slaughter of children in a womb you once came from. That's why it's ironic. Every pro-choice that I've met is actually quite grateful that their mother didn't exercise a woman's right to choose. Now they say, but I wouldn't have known. I wouldn't have known that I got aborted. Yes, but you're probably glad you're here, and so am I. The womb was created to be the most safe place for a human being to reside. Did you know that? Did you know some women who are pregnant and get cancer and undergo chemotherapy anyways, in the vast majority of cases, the baby is born perfectly fine and flawless? Did you know that? Why? Because the womb was created to protect you. And it's become the most dangerous place for a human being to find themselves in America in 2021. Today, abortion is the leading cause of death, and you're more likely to be killed as a human in a womb than you are residing or living in any dangerous city or crime-ridden slum. Where one is has no bearing on who one is, to quote Frank Beckwith. Size, level of development, environment, and dependency. Okay, Remember, these are just the new... 21st century woke categories and functions that are used to deny personhood to the unborn. Yes, the child's dependent on the mother. Question, does that dependency stop after birth? What happens if you leave an infant in a crib and do nothing? Infant dies. Mom and dad charged with infanticide. But what if the mom tells the judge in a court of law, but judge, I was told in my lesbian dance theory major at UC Berkeley, I was told I have bodily autonomy. And I, I didn't know that bodily autonomy stopped after birth, right? My breasts, my choice. My body, my choice. So I just didn't nurse the child because it's dependent on me. And I have bodily autonomy. Would the judge accept that form of argumentation? No, I don't think so. In fact, the judge would probably say, um, lady, it was because your child was more dependent that you had a greater obligation to care for the child. As Mother Teresa might say, we as a society will be judged by how we treat the most vulnerable and needy among us. That is a test of our moral compass. If we can kill the child in the womb purely because they're dependent on their mother, can we kill born people who are dependent on heart pacemakers, kidney machines, insulin, life support, 
or a caretaker. Like the child in the womb, they would be dependent on someone or something else without which they cannot continue to live. So who wants to get on board with killing those people with me? Of course not. But ideas do have consequences. And so now we're having a stupid debate in our country about what? Euthanasia. Doctor-assisted suicide. Now, euthanasia, of course, would not be a given with consent, right? But hey, it's fine. It's fine because like the child in the womb, they're dependent. And like the child in the womb, us, us political elites have determined that they're also unwanted or a burden. Mm, yes, ideas do have consequences and bad ideas have victims. Well, those are the four ways in which the practitioners of genocide deny personhood to the unborn. They're different categories, they're different functions, but the end result is the same. And the error is the same. Because in each case, whether you're a Jew, a slave, or a baby in the womb, you're all human. We all share that common human nature from the moment we are human. And when does the science say we were human? The moment of conception. This is not the perspective of a pro-lifer. This is the perspective of science. So you should be concerned about the genocide of abortion for two reasons, whether you're pro-choice or pro-life. Firstly, you should be concerned about the genocide of abortion for unselfish reasons, purely because it's taken the lives of more innocent human beings than any other injustice in human history. The second reason you should be concerned about the genocide of abortion is actually for selfish reasons. So even if you are pro-choice and you are not bothered in the slightest by one million abortions a year in this country, I think you should still be concerned about the genocide of abortion for selfish reasons. Because the same ideology that justifies abortion justified slavery in the Holocaust and it could be used to justify killing you. This is why Lincoln pointed out that racists were ready putting into place the premises that would justify their own enslavement. Because if we can discriminate against black people because of the shade of their skin color and IQ, then we can also, along with that same ideology, discriminate against whites for different shades of skin color or IQ. Putting into place the premises that justify your own freaking enslavement. So you should be concerned about the genocide of abortion for selfish reasons because you want to protect your own natural rights. And if a country that denies the right to life to an entire class of human beings is willing to do that and call it reproductive health care and reproductive justice, you cannot trust them to protect any of your other rights that flow from the first and most important of all rights, the right to life. Another way to say that is this, if you don't get the right to life right, you won't get any other rights right. Abortion, like slavery before it, denies the very premises of this republic, which is what we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all human beings are created equal, are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are liberty, pursuit of happiness, and life. Oh, no, no, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Why in that order? Because natural liberties mean don't mean much. In fact, they mean nothing at all if you can be murdered. That's the first point of comparison between abortion and historically recognized forms of genocide, the denial of personhood status, whatever that means. The second point of comparison is dehumanizing portrayals of the victim class that you want the society to not like or to view as inconvenient or worse yet, as vermin. Hmm. With slavery, blacks were often assigned dehumanizing names such as Mingo, Savage, Gollywog, Jezebel, Jezebel, and many more. And through images were portrayed as subhuman. And you're probably quite familiar with this. It's probably one of the only things we can trust our secular universities to actually teach is the history of racism. You're very familiar with this. With the Holocaust, cartoons were routinely used to depict Jews as dogs, pigs, rats, and other vermin. And these are just a few of them. And Nazis used words like parasites and bacillus. You want to know what bacillus means? Bacteria to describe those that they exterminated. East Europeans were considered untermensch. You want to know what untermensch means? Subhuman. So not, not like a full human, like maybe biologically human, but certainly not a person. And untermensch, as you might know, was the title of Heinrich Himmler's propaganda book that pushed, pro, uh, that pushed Nazi ideology within the culture. And with abortion today, unborn and aborted children are labeled, have you heard this one, POC? Products of conception? Products of conception. 
Imagine labeling your toddler whom you drowned in the lake, product of conception. We're all products of conception. That's where we all began, my goodness. And the unborn has been routinely compared to animal fetuses. And maybe you've seen some of these comparisons before. Abortionist Warren Hearn, in his medical textbook, Abortion Practiced, which, by the way, is the most widely used medical textbook teaching medical students how to kill babies in the womb, how to perform abortions. <laughs> Warren Hearn has killed tens of thousands of children in the womb, made a lot of money doing so. He actually analogizes the unborn to parasites in his textbook, Abortion Practice. Here's what Warren Hearn says. The relationship between the mother and the baby can be understood best as one of host and parasite. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that those within our, the scientific field don't understand the definition of words? Do you know what parasite means? It means a different entity than the host. Here's the definition of parasite. An organism that lives on or in an organism of another species and benefits from deriving nutrients at the other's expense. Is the unborn a different species than the mother? No, they're all human beings. This is the type of bigotry used to dehumanize the unborn. In response to the type of dehumanizing portrayals that are so popular within the culture, I believe we as pro-life individuals or as those who are horrified by the fact that the right to life is being denied to an entire class of human beings, ought to show humanizing portrayals of the unborn. Embryoscopy, prenatal imagery of what the child looks like in the womb. And if you want to see some of the most beautiful imagery of this, you can go to ehd.org. E-H-D is in dad.org. It stands for the Endowment for Human Development. E-H-D.org. The Endowment for Human Development teamed up with National Geographic. A group largely perceived as nonpartisan, right? Probably packed with liberals, as most of our institutions are. So it's not a pro-life group, right? It's not what National Geographic is. They teamed up on this project to produce something called embryoscopy. Embryoscopy is not ultrasonography. It's not ultrasounds. Embryoscopy is a small camera inserted up the birth canal. And because the amniotic sac is clear, you can see the baby. This is not through the mother's abdomen on her skin with an ultrasound. This is inside the uterus. You can see the baby yawn, react to light. You can see their tongue. And because their skin is still translucent, you can see their heart beating through their skin all at the six, seven, and eight week stage of development. Go check it out. Humanizing portrayals of the unborn to counter the culture of death. But I think we also have to show what abortion does to these very human individuals. Given the widespread dehumanization of the unborn and the widespread support of abortion, it's important for us to see who the unborn is and what abortion does to the unborn. And I'll actually make this point. If you're pro-choice, I actually think you have a moral obligation to look at what abortion does. Here's why. It's easy to be pro-choice if you never have to look at what that choice looks like. That's why. And by the way, if reproductive health care, women's rights, and reproductive justice is such a good thing, as I'm told every day, then wouldn't you want people to see such a good thing? It's very interesting. People are very angry when abortion imagery is shown, which begs the question, if abortion is such a great idea, why does a simple picture of it piss you off so much? And this is not because I believe that abortion imagery should be shown. This is because honest pro-abortion advocates believe so. Anyone know the name Naomi Wolf? One of the leading pro-abortion advocates and feminists in the country. One of the things I appreciate about Naomi Wolf as someone who couldn't disagree with more with pretty much everything she believes is she's intellectually honest and consistent. And intellectually consistent and honest pro-choicers are actually some of the most scary ones because they're admitting that they will carry their premises to their logical conclusions, ghoulish as those conclusions may be. Here's what Naomi Wolf had to say in a New Republic article several years ago. You ready for this? This will rip your face off. The pro-choice movement often treats with contempt the pro-lifers practice of holding up to our faces their disturbing graphics. But how can we charge that it is vile and re repulsive for pro-lifers to brandish vile and repulsive images if the images are real? Hmm. To insist that truth is in poor taste is the very height of hypocrisy. Besides, if these images are often the facts of the matter, and if we as feminists then claim that it is offensive for pro-choice women to be confronted with them, then we are making the judgment that women are too inherently weak 
to face the truth about which they have to make a grave decision. This view is unworthy of feminism. <laughs> so insisting that we shouldn't show abortion imagery because it's, ew, that's nasty. Don't offend people. That's not appropriate in the public square. According to one of the leading feminists in America is a stupid position because it says women are too inherently weak to face the reality of the procedure of what their procedure looks like that they're contemplating right now. And she defends abortion through point of birth. She hasn't changed her mind, but she's saying, yeah, we shouldn't treat these images as in poor taste if they're the facts of the matter. So I disagree with Naomi Wolf. And I think we should look at all the facts before we determine if we're going to remain pro-choice. So having said that, I'm gonna show a, vo a short video clip about a minute long that shows what abortion does to the unborn, okay? And for those who say those are doctored fake images, you ever heard that? Those pro-lifers, those are fake images. Really, then what do real abortion pictures look like? If you're pro-choice and you think pro-lifers hold up doctored fake images to horrify people by abortion, can you show me what real ones look like? I don't think you can because these are medically accurate depictions of the gestational age of the babies who were killed. If you would like to opt out of the presentation, feel free to do so. That's what liberty means. It means you can practice your own decisions, calculate your own risks. If you don't want to watch this, fine by me. Don't look. But we're going to play this short video clip anyways. Now listen, I don't show that imagery to anyone to shame or condemn them. If you are post-abortive, if you've had an abortion, whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, I do not sh show that imagery to shame or condemn you or to insinuate that you're a practitioner of genocide. I am a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am a Christian, and I believe that you don't need an excuse for what you did. You need an exchange, Christ's righteousness for yours. And as a uh, Christian who worships an unborn child, uh, Jesus Christ who entered human history in a womb uh, that he once knit together, I believe that the God-man is the only solution for human mankind's obsession with sin. And so if you want to talk about this, if you at all have experienced trauma because of an abortion you have gotten, I or people at the club would love to talk with you, would love to share the gospel with you, would love to explain that we believe that there is healing and that Jesus is just as eager to forgive the sin of abortion as any other sin. If you're not a Christian and you think that this is all religious nonsense, you'll notice I haven't made a single religious argument as to why you should be pro pro-life. I'm merely making a scientific and philosophical case, but I do believe that that is the um, solution for your soul. So hear that and receive that and know that anyone here would love to talk to you more about that. You know, Camille Paglia, another feminist and pro-choice academic and professor at the University of Arts in Philadelphia, once wrote the following, admitting that abortion is murder. Another very rare, intellectually consistent pro-choicer. Here's what she said. And she's not changed her mind. She still supports abortion through point of birth. Hence, I have always frankly admitted that abortion is murder. The extermination of the powerless by the powerful. By the way, that would be another great definition of genocide, huh? The extermination of the powerless by the powerful. She goes on to say, liberals for the most part have shrunk from facing the ethical consequences of their embrace of abortion, which results in the annihilation of concrete individuals and not just clumps of insensate tissue. Again, I have all the citations here if you'd like to see them. Well, it's time for pro-choicers to join Camille Paglia in admitting that abortion kills and murders an innocent human being. 
All the imagery you just saw in that clip were babies that were killed entirely legally and funded by your tax dollars. For people who say third trimester abortions are not a thing, have you heard that late term abortions don't happen? That's not a thing in America. Really, then why can you go to the Guttmacher Institute, Planned Parenthood Statistical Research Branch, and get the percentages of what number of abortions are performed in the third trimester every year in America? That would be very strange for them to report that if they were legal, huh? Abortion is legal through all nine months of pregnancy for any reason or no reason at all. And we fund Planned Parenthood at the tune of $600 million a year. So the first two points of comparison between abortion and historically recognized forms of genocide is the denial of personhood status of people that we actually know are humans. By creating a class of humans, of, of human persons and a class of human non-persons, whatever that means. The second point of comparison is dehumanizing portrayals of the victim class to inoculate the culture with a certain bigoted view of the victims in question. The third point of comparison is that victims have something that others want to use, something that they can benefit from by mistreating them, enslaving them, or just murdering them. Okay? With slavery, blacks were wanted for their work product, right? Duh, you know this. They were also used in harmful experiments to obtain medical information. Tuskegee, anyone, right? We'll just experiment on humans that we describe as non-persons to benefit us and to improve the quality of life of people whose natural rights are not being abused. How ironic. With the Holocaust, as you're probably well aware, Nazis in, 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 en envied and eventually stole Jewish wealth before they threw them in concentration camps in what we can call, I guess, state-sanctioned theft known as Aryanization. You're probably very familiar with this, right? Just showed up, knocked on their doors and says, what, what goods do you have here to benefit the Aryan race? And of course, deadly medical experiments were also performed on Jewish prisoners. Deadly medical experiments seems to be a recurring theme here. You'll find the same thing on abortion. With abortion, the unborn are killed in the process of removing their stem cells. Anyone heard of embryonic stem cell research? By the way, do you want to know how many diseases and ailments are currently being effectively treated through embryonic stem cell research? Zero. Do you want to know how many diseases and ailments that adult stem cells are being actively used right now to treat and solve? Oh, over 70. But pro-choicers continue to insist we need to kill a lot of babies through embryonic stem cells. If you don't know, Yes, removing a baby's stem cells uh, requires killing them in the womb, requires aborting them to improve the quality of life of those who were already born, who are former fetuses and former womb dwellers who were not themselves murdered. I call that born privilege. And these procedures are rationalized under the guise of helping the born. Well, racist Nazis in the pro-abortion movement all justify the mistreatment or murder of human beings as a necessary or sometimes even righteous, right? endeavor and action in order to improve or benefit their own lives. You're familiar with this. Many individuals throughout the abortion debate over the last 48 years have insisted that it's not just a necessary evil, it's righteous, it's good that we continue to pursue embryonic stem cell research, which murders innocent human beings to help the born. That would be the third point of comparison. The fourth is that victims are seen as a burden, right? Just a burden and drag on society. With slavery, even after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, emancipated slaves were considered unable to take care of themselves and seen as a drain on society's resources. Oh, bummer, we lost all of our free labor that we use these image bearers of God, I'll argue, and human beings to build our cotton economy over the whipped backs of blacks that we treated like animals. Oh, now we have to compensate them for their work? Ugh, I built up my whole cotton economy with free labor. What the heck, man? That's inconvenient. You're a drag on me now. I have to pour in resources to pay you? My goodness. Racism. In the Holocaust, the disabled and elderly were considered, and here's the language Nazis used, useless eaters. Have you heard that term before? Useless eaters. They don't need German resources. These people are not persons. That was how they described the elderly or those with certain ailments. This is what we call what eugenics today, right? The slow and deliberate extermination those our society deems unfit to live. And they were seen as using up resources that fit Germans needed, right? In order to improve the Aryan race. Well, with abortion, the sick, disabled, or deformed unborn children are considered a drain on a family's or society's resources, right? Ever heard that? Well, this child has Down syndrome. Oh, they don't have a limb. Oh, their intestines are born outside their body. Oh, no. You know how expensive that's going to be to raise that child? Plus, you know, the child's probably not even going to like their life. You know, it's not going to be the same quality of life. You should probably just kill them in the womb. You know, that's compassionate. Right, that's when you look at your toddler who has some type of medical or mental deficiency and you say, 
I mean, I know you smile a lot, but like me as my own God who gets to decide what level of happiness is sufficient to continue to go on living. I just need to kill you, Timmy, because I actually know in my all powerful sovereignty and wisdom that you're actually going to appreciate being murdered more than going through certain difficulties in this life as you continue to live. That's what's behind abortion of children who are deemed unfit to live by our new woke bigoted society. A 2012 study actually compiled the results of 24 different studies on the termination rate of babies diagnosed with Down syndrome and found that 67% of babies diagnosed with Down syndrome in America are aborted. And some believe that percentage actually to be far smaller or uh, too small. Many believe the percentage is far higher. And you're probably aware in Iceland or was it Iceland or Greenland in 2019, they celebrated that they had eradicated Down syndrome from their country. And many people who still think our media is not biased were like, how did they do that? We fixed Down syndrome? They eradicate? How did they do it? Oh, you mean you murder everyone that you diagnose with Down syndrome through the amniocentesis test in the womb? Oh, that's what you mean. So you're, you're a eugenicist. But don't worry, you mask your position through compassion, right? Just saying, we eradicated Down syndrome. Disgusting. Unwanted, unborn children are viewed as interfering with the lifestyle or career advancements of their parents, right? So even if it's a child who doesn't have a physical or mental deformity or deficiency, then their death and dismemberment is justified because that child will be a drag on the resources of their parents who believe that the ultimate good in life is to make a whole crap ton of money. According to the Guttmacher Institute, once again, Planned Parenthood Statistical Research Branch, fully 95% of abortions are done for socioeconomic reasons. Did you know that? 95% of abortions, according to the Guttmacher Institute, are performed for socioeconomic reasons. Let me translate socioeconomic for you. Convenience. Convenience for social reasons or economic reasons. Now, someone might say, yeah, but they won't be able to afford the baby. That's not just convenient. No, it is, it is, it's just convenience. <laughs> yes, it will be harder. You might have to work more hours. You might have to get another job, but you were killing that child for convenience reasons. Victims are seen as a burden. The fourth point of comparison here. If human value is based on wantedness and convenience, and therefore mothers should have the right to obtain an abortion through all nine months of pregnancy, especially if her baby has Down syndrome, right? You don't want to inconvenience mom with such a baby then why should that right be taken from her six inches and 60 seconds later? I've never been able to have a pro choice or give me a very compelling answer to this question, right? If the child is defined and determined as unwanted, a burden, inconvenient, and that that reason alone is a sufficient one to abort the baby, then why should that right be taken to her 60 seconds after birth and six inches away. The child only moves six inches through the birth canal during childbirth. Did you know that? Well, what if that child is still inconvenient and a burden? What if we didn't never had the amniocentesis test, which we haven't for vast majority of human history, and you didn't know the baby had Down syndrome until they were born? What pro-choicers do you know would support infanticide of children who have Down syndrome right after they're born? You probably don't know too many except Peter freaking Singer. Hmm. What's changed in the moral status of that unwanted child because they move six inches? Oh, I know. Did you know this actually? The fetus fairy flies up and sprinkles magical personhood conferring fairy dust on the child as it exits the birth canal. So when that last toe leaves the vaginal canal, did you know this? It's a person now. This is nonsense. Obviously, nobody actually believes this. The birth canal does not confer personhood. <laughs> That should tune us into the reality that these are human beings, regardless of their level of development or their location. Well, that's the fourth point of comparison between these historically recognized forms of genocide is that victims are seen as a burden. What's the fifth and last point of comparison? The sheer volume of victims killed. A lot of dead, murdered, innocent human beings. <laughs> With slavery, it's estimated that between eight and a half to 13 million slaves died in transport to the New World. Those were those that just died in transport, not to mention the ones who survived and then were brutalized with the horror of American slavery. Between eight and a half and 13 million slaves died in transport to the New World. In the Holocaust, six million Jews and five million others were murdered. You know, there's about 13 million people were murdered, um, six million of which were Jews. With abortion, ready for this number? 
one and a half billion, with a B, unborn children have been murdered worldwide since 1980. We kill over 50 million babies a year worldwide. Over 63 million babies have been aborted in America since 1973 in the last 48 years. And we kill about a million babies every year in America. Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry make Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin look like toddlers playing in a freaking sandbox. They would bow the knee to Roe versus Wade, who succeeded in killing more innocent human beings with the same type of justifications than they could have ever hoped to have done so. Those are the five points of comparison between abortion and historically recognized forms of genocide. But I want to make another point here. You see, not satisfied being the greatest genocide in human history, the abortion juggernaut not only kills more human beings than any other genocide, but they have also absorbed the strategies and bigotry of racists and Nazis. What I mean is that the abortion industry is not happy just killing more human beings than have ever been killed in human history. They actually look and learn from racists and Nazis in order to become a more effective killing machine. Now you're thinking, what the heck are you talking about? If you're pro-choice, you're probably about to walk out of the room. Who's this white cisgender male speaking this absolute gobbledygook? You guys seen the show Stranger Things? And you remember the mind flayer that absorbed the human beings that it killed and in so doing became a more effective killing machine? The abortion industry is just like the mind flayer in Stranger Things. Not only do they absorb the human beings that they kill, right, because they get filthy rich off of the killing of innocent human beings, and then they sell their dead baby body parts on the black market. And then our vice president prosecutes pro-life undercover journalists for exposing Planned Parenthood, admitting on camera that they sell dead baby body parts on the black market for extra crash, breaking federal law doing so. But that's a conversation for another time. They absorb these other genocides to become a more effective killing machine. What do I mean by that? The abortion industry has absorbed the racism of the KKK. That's what I mean by that. The co-founder of Black Lives Matter, a woman named Alicia Garza, teamed up with the former president of Planned Parenthood, Cecile Richards, arguably the most dangerous racist in American history. Why? Because as president of Planned Parenthood, she oversaw more murdered black unborn babies in two weeks than the KKK lynched in a century. And those are accurate statistics. I can show them to you. Planned Parenthood alone, not the abortion industry, Planned Parenthood alone, that one organization, kills more unarmed black lives through abortion every 14 days than the KKK lynched in an entire hundred years. And you have the co-founder of an organization called Black Lives Matter <laughs> teaming up with the most dangerous individual to black Lives. If that's not ironic, I don't know what is. Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, was a racist and a eugenicist. She spoke at a KKK rally. She launched something called the Negro Project in order to try to convince Black America to use lots of birth control to control the Black population because she didn't want more Black people. Did you know that? Margaret Sanger actually wanted to use even forced birth control to weed out blacks, disabled, and the mentally ill. So she was a racist and eugenicist. Here's something she wrote. I'll show you the citation if you'd like. Before eugenicists and others who are laboring for racial betterment, uh, that's another euphemism. That doesn't mean getting more jobs for black Americans. That means uh, less black people can succeed in securing racial betterment. They must first clear the way for birth control. Like the advocates of birth control, the eugenicists are seeking to assist the race toward the elimination of the unfit. Birth control of itself, by freeing the reproductive instinct from its present chains, will make a better race. Eugenics without birth control seems to us a house built upon the sands. It is at the rising stream of the unfit. And black Americans were within the category of those that she described as unfit to live. Margaret Sanger hobnobbed with the founders of the American Eugenics Society. Did you know that? They were BFS, the founders of the American Eugenics Society. And Adolf Hitler, after his failed a coup attempt in Munich, was writing fan mail to the authors of the founders 
of the American Eugenics Society on their new book where they laid out their goal for eugenics policies within America. And Hitler based much of his eugenics policy, federal policy within Germany, off of the ideas articulated in that book by the founders of the American Eugenics Society, of whom Margaret Sanger was best freaking friends. Here's another line from Margaret Sanger in a letter she wrote to Dr. Clarence Gamble. We do not want word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. According to U.S. Census Bureau statistics, African Americans account for 13% of the population, but obtain 36% of the country's abortions in 2015. Now, Black America, 13% of the population, does that mean they're all women? No. So cut it in half. What are we at? Six and a half percent? Yeah. Are all of those women of childbearing age? No. So cut that six and a half percent of the American public, maybe in half or in third again. So you have about three percent of the American public that obtains 36 percent of the annual abortions in this country. And so the most dangerous place for an African-American to be today is, in fact, in the womb. And Planned Parenthood kills more unarmed black lives in two weeks than the KKK lynched in a century. And my friends at the Radiance Foundation rewrote Planned Parenthood's mantra here as eugenics no matter what. Not only has the abortion industry absorbed the racism of the KKK, they've also absorbed the strategies of the Nazis. What do I mean by this? Planned Parenthood and the abortion juggernaut know the disproportionate amount of abortions that the black community obtains. They know this. So we shouldn't be surprised when, according to the Center for Urban Renewal and Education that published a policy report in 2015 entitled The Effects of Abortion on the Black Community, reported that 79 percent of Planned Parenthood surgical abortion facilities are strategically located within walking distance of African and or Hispanic communities. Because of this, the black birth rate has nearly flatlined in this country and Margaret Sanger's dream has largely been realized which is controlling the black population and decreasing the black population. I thought we were supposed to be anti-racist, right? This new term. You know what would be anti-racist? Wanting more black people in America. Wanting them to represent a larger percentage of the American public, not less. Planned Parenthood has this tweet from 2019. I think you can still find it. Here's what they tweeted. It is, if you're a black woman in America, it is statistically safer to get an abortion than to give birth to your child than to go through childbirth. If you're a black woman in America, it is statistically safer to get an abortion than to give birth to your child. You can find this tweet on Planned Parenthood. Now, from a purely objective standpoint, that's actually not true. I don't have time to dive into the, the false data behind the claim that abortion is safer than childbirth. There's a study they throw around. Abortion is 14 times safer than childbirth. There's a bunch of BS and baloney. I don't have time to get into it. From a self-evident level, you should understand that. Forcibly dilating the cervix before it's supposed to naturally dilate itself and then sticking forceps or a vacuum up the birth canal while you try to not rip through the uterine lining. That should be self-evident to you that that's not safer than the natural biological process of childbirth. And if you can't see that from a self-evident level, I got nothing for you. But this is the tweet they put out. So let me translate that to you. If you're a black woman and you're pregnant in America and you really care about your health, you really care about you and your family, you know, you always have to get an abortion. And that would be where that premise would lead, right? If it's true that it's statistically safer to get an abortion as a pregnant black woman in America than giving birth to your child. Can you think of a more racist tweet for Planned Parenthood to tweet? My freaking goodness. But they've also absorbed the strategies of the Nazis. Listen, Planned Parenthood isn't the first human rights violator to build a death camp in a strategic location to exterminate as many undesirables as possible. Is that a hell of a line or what? Ready for this? In December 2009, History.com released an article entitled Auschwitz. That was just the name of the article. And it tells the story of the infamous death camp's genesis. Here's what this article said. Once Hitler's final solution became a official Nazi policy... Auschwitz was deemed an ideal death camp location. It was in close proximity to the string of rail lines used to transport detainees to the network of Nazi camps. Let me translate that for you. Auschwitz was conveniently located to make it quick and easy to import and exterminate as many undesirables as possible. It was really convenient. You could make more money on it. You could kill more human beings and become a more efficient killing machine because the railroads that were used to transport all the human beings that you packed in like cattle was really close to that concentration camp. Planned Parenthoods are conveniently located to make it quick and easy to import and exterminate undesirable and unwanted black babies who they abort at a significantly disproportionate rate. But they team up with 
Black Lives Matter. Interesting. Well, what do we do in response to all of this? If abortion is genocide, then it is the greatest genocide in human history. If it's genocide, then we all have a role to play in ending it by making personal sacrifices to change minds, change hearts, and save lives. And so I want to finish with the story of a man you're very familiar with. His name is Oscar Schindler. Maybe you've read the book. Maybe you've seen the movie Schindler's List. If you haven't, I'm sorry, this is a spoiler, but you should learn his story. This was a story of a man who sacrificed everything to engage the evil of his time. Did you know Oscar Schindler was a member of the Nazi party? But you see, he began to become horrified at the atrocities being committed against his Jewish brothers and sisters, his fellow human beings, his neighbors. So Oscar Schindler is a very rich entrepreneur and businessman, began to exhaust his great net worth and wealth to what? To purchase Jews off of the Nazi death camp list, but not purchase them in the sense of buying human beings like slaves, but to employ them in his factory, pay them in order to hide them from the Nazis. Did you know this? According to reports and the findings of history, because of Oscar Schindler's sacrifices, over 1,000 Jews were saved from that Holocaust. Now, unfortunately, that's a small number compared to the 6 million that were murdered. But that's a very good thing. Wonderful human beings, our neighbors, spared from a Holocaust bent on their destruction that defined them as non-persons. If you've seen the film Schindler's List, You'll know that at the end of the film, Oscar Schindler standing surrounded by all of these Jewish men, women, and children who owe him their very lives. Right? And the announcement rings out that the war has won. The Allied troops have won. And all of his Jewish friends begin celebrating. But Oscar Schindler stands in the middle of them and he starts weeping. Why? This is a good thing, right? Well, through tears down his face, he says, I could have saved one more. He looks at his fancy car, one of the last items he actually owned because he was broke, because he gave it all away to save innocent human beings. And he says, my car, my car, why did I keep this? I could have sold this and saved 10 more. He looks at his golden pin, which identifies him as a member of the Nazi party. And he says, this is gold. Why did I keep my pin? I could have sold this and I could have saved three more, at least one more. And he repeats over and over again through tears down his face, I could have saved one more. This is coming from a man who went to the wall to love his neighbor, yeah? And save innocent human beings from a Holocaust. So the question before us today is this one. Do we take our Holocaust in 2021 as seriously as Oscar Schindler took his? If we do, if we truly do, then we must be pro-life because the unborn children in our midst are indeed small human beings who share our human nature. We must vote pro-life because it's a moral wrong to vote for a party who promises to protect and defend the slaughter of an entire class of human beings that they know and admit to be human beings. We must give generously of our time and our money to save lives. And we must be people of life who show the world that having children and choosing life doesn't end your life. It improves it. We must believe and live the truth that all children are a blessing. You know, it's interesting. What does the pro-choice movement say? Women should have the right to choose an abortion for their career and their feminism and their achievements. And this is why they hated, hated Amy Coney Barrett. Do you remember? It was interesting. They didn't know what to do with Amy Coney Barrett, did they? A Catholic mom of seven, five biological children, children two that she adopted from Haiti, about to be nominated to the highest court in the land at the time. And they smeared her as a bigot. But she accomplished more than any of these woke pro-abortion feminists ever have, which is to build a family, to foster and raise children, and to be successful in their, her career. Hmm. You see, she destroyed all their feminist identity boxes, which is, you can't do that, women. If you're going to be successful in this world, you're probably going to have to kill a few babies through abortion on the way up. And she shows the truth of life, that we can embrace children and we can embrace life and we can still pursue our callings and our passions. If your generation and the next generation can commit to these things wholeheartedly, we can end the genocide of abortion so that every baby is unaborted and abortion becomes unthinkable, illegal, and unnecessary. That is why I believe abortion to be genocide. <laughs> 
In the meantime, if you're pro-life, I will see you on the battlefield. If you're not, you can uh, fight me on the battlefield and we can fight over these ideas and have respectful conversations as we try to pursue truth together. In the meantime, go out there and give them heaven. Thank you, guys. So with the time remaining, we're going to do some Q&A. We do have mics um, set up. And so if you'd like to ask any questions, um, we want to give you the time to do so. If you need to leave, okay, for whatever reason, feel free to do so. You, there, there's no expectation for you to stick around. Um, if you are pro-choice and you disagree with me, thank you for being here. Thank you for having the courage of your convictions to come and hear your convictions challenged. Um, and uh, we'd welcome you to ask any question you'd like. Um, I do believe in the marketplace of ideas, the university, and I believe that we should engage with ideas that we disagree over in a respectful manner. And I will treat you, if you disagree with me, with dignity and respect. And I would ask that you would do the same. So, first question. <laughs> What's your name, firstly? Uh, my name is Daniel. Daniel, good to meet you. Good to meet you, too. Uh, I wanted to thank Yeah, you can take that out if you yeah. want. Yeah, go for it. I wanted to thank you for your talk and for coming to speak to us. Um, I think one of the reasons this is such a hard issue for so many Americans is because there's so much dishonesty on both sides. Um, and I think for, I agree with you, for a lot of pro-choice people, that dishonesty is denying the humanity of the unborn. I do think there's dishonesty on the pro-life side. So, um, you talked about a lot of things tonight, but there were a lot of things that you didn't talk about. And one of the things that you didn't talk about was actually the practicality of lowering the abortion rate. Um, the, the countries in the world where the abortion rate is lowest, and this is based on statistics, not just from Good Marker, but from peer-reviewed journals like The Lancet, the lowest abortion rates in the world are in countries where abortion has been legal for years, but is highly regulated. Um, that would include Denmark, the Netherlands. Um, and yeah, countries where abortion is illegal have comparable abortion rates to countries where it's broadly legal. And in fact, the countries where abortion is illegal are countries that are ruled by authoritarian governments that have a vested interest in controlling the personal choices of their people, not just with abortion, but with the whole set of issues. Yeah, some of them, yeah. So if America <coughs> banned abortion, America would be in the company of nations like Iraq, the Philippines, Egypt, El Salvador, Nicaragua, the countries uh, in Sudan and Libya, Saudi Arabia, several others. These are countries uh, that we as Americans critique vehemently for their lack of democracy, for their control of their own people, for their authoritarian government. Something you didn't mention is that slavery and the Holocaust, those were perpetrated by governments against a group of people. Right. Would you like me to respond to anything you've said or, or do you have a question? Well, my Just question, for the sake of time. My question to you, yeah. I do have a question. I didn't come up here to hear myself talk. <laughs> no worries. I, do have a question. I appreciate it. So my question is, do you have data, do you have statistics, do you have practical <clears throat> arguments for why making abortion illegal is the best option? Mm -hmm. And why should we make abortion legal if that would put us in the company of all these authoritarian companies? Right. Good question. Thank you. Appreciate it. What was your name again? Daniel. Daniel. Um, firstly, we're not really in a position, right, to, to criticize the moral compass of authoritarian regimes while we murder a million babies a year. <laughs> and I find it interesting that some of these authoritarian regimes, and Daniel's right, there are authoritarian countries and regimes in which abortion is illegal, and they're probably not countries that we would want to live in. But they seem to have more, more moral clarity on abortion than we do. That doesn't mean that they're a just society by any means. They're certainly not a constitutional republic with uh, uh, political power put into the hands of the people. But it certainly doesn't make us any better for our practice of womb lynchings today um, through abortion. The, I think the premise and assumption of Daniel's question um, is this, that pro-lifers just want to decrease abortions. So he talked about how a lot of these countries that in which abortion is legal but regulated have some of the, lo lo the, some of the uh, smallest abortion rates. Well, that, the assumption in that statement is that pro-lifers are happy just decreasing abortions. That is not the goal of the pro-life movement. Let me be very clear. We will celebrate the decrease of abortions if and when and where it happens. That is not our goal. Our goal is to make abortion illegal 
and unthinkable. So question, can you accomplish making abortion unthinkable by remaining to allow it to be legal? No, and here's why. Law functions as a teacher. This is something Aristotle taught us, right? Aristotle said statecraft is soulcraft. Statecraft is soulcraft. What did he mean by that? He meant that uh, a nation through its laws and policies actually teach and encourage what they view as the good life. They plant moral premises in the law. Law functions as a teacher. Do you think America was ready to abolish slavery? No, we weren't. We fought a, uh, what was it? Oh yeah, civil war over it. The most bloodiest war ever. <laughs> I, I don't think we were ready in our social fabric to abolish slavery. But are we grateful that the law stepped in and said this thing is no longer legal or acceptable in what we want to be a civilized society? Yes, I think all of us, pro-choice or pro-life, are very grateful that, oh, by the way, the, the Republican Party was successful in, a, in abolishing the evil of slavery. Now, of course, we had another, was it 99 years of unjust treatment against black Americans, literally through systemic racism, being denied the right to vote, being denied the right to access businesses and dine in the same places as whites and many, many, many other racist practices. So yes, it took a long time. Here's the thing. It would have taken a hell of a lot longer had we not made slavery illegal. Why? Because law functions as a teacher. You want another example of this? No fault divorce laws. Did divorces increase, stay the same, or decrease after we started no-fault divorce laws? They freaking skyrocketed. Why? Because law functions as a teacher. So a society through its policies um, uh, deem which type of behaviors are, are necessary, are acceptable, or not acceptable in a civilized society. So as long as we continue to advance the notion through our policies that abortion is legal, we're actually relegating that action into the category of acceptable. And those who say otherwise would not say the same thing on slavery, would they? I, I don't think anyone in this room would say that uh, law that uh, America, through its policies of calling slavery illegal, were saying that slavery was acceptable. <laughs> no, that's a stupid thing to suggest. We, we made it illegal in order to say this is unacceptable. And that became the new political and social reality for the next generations. So when generations of young people grow up in America learning that what? Abortion is genocide? Murder? Child abuse? No. Reproductive health care, reproductive justice, and women's rights. Do you think that doesn't have an impact on the positions that Americans hold on abortion? No, of course it does. They grow up thinking that abortion is just that. What their woke professors and high school teachers taught them, that this is necessary in order to maintain women's rights. Now, not pre-born women's rights, of course, who are killed on the altar of women's rights, which is very ironic. So we can't achieve our goals, which is to make abortion illegal and unthinkable, as long as we continue to allow legal abortion, but say, oh, we'll just regulate it. Some people say, oh, democratic policy policies decrease abortions. Have you heard this one? So real pro-lifers vote for Democrats, for the Democratic Party. You mean the party who in their statement and their platform says that they defend abortion through all nine months of pregnancy, want to codify Roe v. Wade into federal law and remove the Hyde Amendment so we have to fund abortions through Medicaid? Yeah, they tell us that pro-lifers should vote for that party because they'll decrease abortion through their policies. This is what they tell us. Now, the abortion rate has been decreasing for decades. Did you know this? Across different presidential administrations. Sounds like you guys are aware of this. So it hasn't just been decreasing across uh, Democratic administrations, it's been decreasing across all of them, except Jimmy Carter. Under Jimmy Carter, the abortion rate skyrocketed. <laughs> but but pro-choicers never talk about that administration, of course, because it doesn't fit the example they want to make, which is that Democrat policies decrease abortions. This is just a political attempt to convince squishy Republicans and pro-lifers to vote for Democrats because, oh, that's, that's how you'll achieve your pro-life goals. It's ridiculous. And then they tell us, um, well, the reason that Democratic policies decrease abortions is because it addresses the underlying causes of what leads a woman to choose abortion in the first place. Have you heard this? So they say like social programs and entitlement programs and federal funds and things like this, right? That because, you know, women choose abortion often because they don't have the money or they don't have the support. So we're just going to throw a bunch of federal dollars at them and that will solve it. So we're addressing the underlying causes of why women choose abortion in the first place. So real pro-lifers vote for Democrats. That's one of the talking points, okay? Now, firstly, I don't believe that the underlying status heart of the matter as to why women choose abortion is purely financial. I think it's bigotry. Now, how do I know that? How can I make that case? Because how many parents do you know are murdering their infants and toddlers because they can't pay, they can't pay to feed them? Uh, I don't know any. But that would be the same social struggle. <laughs> but they don't use that as a justification to kill infants, only to kill unborn children. So I think the root issue of what allows abortion to thrive in this country is bigotry, discrimination against the unborn. 
that somehow it's acceptable to kill them because they're smaller, less developed, located elsewhere, and more dependent. So can we change the prenatal bigotry that has so entrenched itself into the minds of the American public by voting for the very party who keeps it legal through point of birth anyways and calls it reproductive health care, reproductive justice, and forces us to fund it with their tax dollars? I think anyone with a semi-functioning prefrontal cortex would have to tell you no. You can't vote for the party that murders babies and calls it a social good while trying to change the social fabric to respect life. Those goals cannot be accomplished. By the way, many racists made the same argument. Did you know this? Many racist Democrats said, <laughs> ready for this? Um, you know, we found that racial violence is the most prevalent in Republican states that favor abolition. You know, because they're trying to abolish slavery. And so they're kind of poking at the social status quo. And so in so doing, it's creating racial tension in that state from plantation owners who are very accustomed to owning human beings and treating them like cattle. And so that's leading to more racial uh, cases of racial violence um, and abuse. So real, real abolitionist Republicans, you should actually vote for the Democratic Party, who's the party of slavery and Jim Crow, because that's the real abolitionist thing to do. I mean, this would be ridiculous. You can't vote for the very party that protects slavery while trying to end slavery. It's a very similar case that's made today when they say if you really care about decreasing ending abortion, you'll vote for Democrats because their policies help cause less of the instances you don't like. It was racial violence then, it's abortion today. So we can't accomplish our goals of making abortion illegal and unthinkable by voting for the very party that has promised, has looked the American face and uh, American eyes in the face and said, we will protect abortion through point of birth. And we're gonna try to coerce you, to, uh, pro-life obstetricians, to perform abortions upon threat of career termination um, and shut down pro-life pregnancy centers and force them to advertise where the local abortion clinic was um, as Xavier Becerra the new HHS director tried to do in California when he was attorney general. So in short, Daniel, none of the goals of the pro-life movement can be achieved by voting for Democrats, even if we grant the premise that sometimes their policies decrease abortion in the short term. That's not our, our goal in the long term. And in fact, we can't accomplish what we want, period, by voting for people who try to protect abortion. And I think that should be self-evident. Let's just jump to someone else and then we'll come back to you. Is that okay? Unless there's no one else and then at which point go for it. Yeah. No, take your time. I don't want you tripping. <laughs> What's your name? Hi, I'm Caroline. Caroline. Seth, first of all, thank you so much for being the voice of the Claudia for I think you're also a voice for science, for sanity, and ultimately for the love of neighbor. So thank we're you. Thank you. Grateful that you're here. Um, my question is regarding um, the stance of. Uh, the likes of Naomi Wolf and Camille um, Pacquiao, who you noted uh, they were at least intellectually honest. Right. To me, the, these uh, women and others have, still have voices in our culture, it really is a statement about the state of our culture. And um, my question is, you know, here we saw the video that you showed, and it's horrifying. You know, mother of six children, I have nine children, oh. and I've seen um, the three of them images when they were in the room without them kicking. It's just beyond belief. Right. I think if in our humanity we can see that and be horrified. But when I see that people um, like Naomi and uh, family can look at that mm -hmm. and say, so what? Uh, it, it, to me, it's like reading a history of Mayan human sacrifices or even just recently watching um, the story of St. Patrick, you know, that Ireland had human sacrifices before St. Patrick went over here as a missionary. Right. So human sacrifices and gore was acceptable in the culture and was justified. That being said, as we recognize the level of human, the ability for us to be self-deceived or to be depraved or to grow callous, to things like this, to human life, right. um, to the vulnerability and pain of others that we can just, how do you, how do you um, see ultimately where you can awaken really the conscience of a nation or conscience of a culture to recognize it, what is acceptable as evil? Right. Yeah, good question. We have to engage in the culture wars, but we also have to engage in the political wars. It's not an either or, it's a both and. 
And I have many people, even within the pro-life movement, who tell me, we're just going to fight the culture wars. We're going try to try to change the hearts of Americans. I'm like, that's wonderful. Um, but sometimes people who only engage in the culture wars, they actually demonize people who work within political advocation groups, right? Because they say, we don't want to be political. We want to be nonpartisan, right? Um, there's a group called Democrats for Life, and they're, they're pro-life. Um, that's fine. If they're going to contend with me and end abortion, that's wonderful. But if they're going to continue to vote for Democrats, you're just furthering the problem. That, 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 does that mean there's no pro-life Democrats? No, that doesn't mean that. There's one named Katrina Jackson, Katrina Jackson out of uh, Louisiana. Um, I don't think there's a single pro-life Democrat in the, in the Senate, though, by the way. <laughs> uh, there's, there were a couple who we thought were. And guess what? They just voted to remove the Hyde Amendment from the stimulus package, which keeps federal dollars from funding abortion through Medicaid reimbursement. So much for being pro-life. So I, there's not a single pro-life Democrat in the Senate. There are some in the House of Representatives. But you can't vote for a party that continues to protect abortion and expect to end abortion. Um, so it has to be both and. Right. So we should continue working at the cultural level to prick the collective conscience of the culture, continue to put abortion in front of them, continue to force them to rationalize it, have conversations with our neighbors and friends. This should happen at the sort of individual community, local level as well, um, while also making the arguments in the case in the public square, which is that abortion is wrong for the same reasons that slavery and the Holocaust are wrong, because in each case it denies the personhood of its victims in order to justify mistreating them. But we can't wait um, for the hearts of Americans to change in order to make abortion illegal. Obviously, eventually that's what we need because we need enough people to vote for politicians who are pro-life to end abortion. But if we can work within our politics to end abortion or to save as many savable children as possible, we should also do that. Again, the culture and country was not ready for Abraham Lincoln to end slavery, (laughs) but we did it. We pulled it off. And those laws began to teach the next generation that this was unacceptable. Does that mean that everyone stopped being racist? No, we had to have a civil rights movement, you know, nearly 90 years later. But it would have taken a lot longer had we not instituted laws against slavery, laws against racial bigotry. So we have to contend on both fronts. But I understand your question and concern, which is that we seem to be so calloused towards the slaughter and death of human beings that sometimes it feels like the imagery and the arguments in the public square are not sufficient to change the minds of the American public. We feel like we're not making progress. When you say um, uh, you've got on both fronts the cultural yeah. uh, arguments and the political, I would argue that there is a third element, which is the social element, which is the spiritual. Oh, yeah. Amen. Um, and I know you argue from a scientific yeah. point of view where um, the spiritual comes in as a yeah, Somebody like... Um, now we can look at the facts and still go, hmm, so right. what? Why not kill human beings? Right, sure. Whereas, um, Abraham, you go back to Abraham, like his conscience came from a faith in God yeah. and a scripture. Right, that he totally. In yeah, and, 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 and as a Christian, I do believe that the Bible's correct when it says that Satan has blinded the eyes of unbelievers so they cannot see the truth. And we're seeing a lot of celebration of Satanism recently, if you're not aware of it. Uh, little Nas X, I never knew who this guy was. Um, I don't follow these woke pop culture warriors. I have no idea who they are. Um, but Guy made Satan shoes, made 666 of them, 666, with human blood in the soul, and did a music video where he gave a lap dance to Satan, half naked, before killing Satan and putting the throne on his head. Um, listen, that, that guy's soul is not just endangered. It's already damned unless he repents. And so, again, I, I, you know, I'm not going to make a biblical case um, for the pro-life position tonight, and I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to talk about my faith to anyone that would like to know. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I would say Satan is a real person, and, and this is also a spiritual battle. Because I believe abortion to be child sacrifice um, to Satan in order to receive a blessing in return, which is what the Aztecs, the Mayans, it's what the Israelites did with the Canaanite god Molech. All of these um, cultures sacrificed children and babies or full-grown adults to what they believed to be pagan deities in order to give a blessing in return, right? The crop god or the war god, right? Or the family god or the sex god or whatever. And so pro-choicers today argue that we should kill babies because we have an overpopulation problem, which is affecting the weather. And so the baby becomes a sacrifice to the weather god, which just goes to show that when the Bible, when when a country abandons God in the moorings of morality, we go right back to worshiping demons, Um, So that would be sort of my perspective on the spiritual aspect of it. And as a Christian, I do believe it's a spiritual battle as well. Um, So we have to pray for our country. Uh, We have to share the gospel. We have to contend politically for the unborn. And we have to make our arguments in the public square, which is that it is entirely rational and reasonable to be pro-life, whether you're a Christian or not. But I do believe that the church, the Christian church, who says we worship an unborn child, Jesus Christ, who became a zygote, an embryo, and a fetus. um, I think that if the church doesn't wake up soon and begin contending politically on behalf of the unborn, 
by encouraging their congregants to run for office, <laughs> by launching uh, C4s to fund the campaigns of Christians who care about the soul of the country and want to be salt and light as a preservative in the country. There's not much left to preserve. The country's gone to bleep. We now celebrate abortion, Satanism, and sacrificing human beings to weather gods. Um, so we have to actually contend for a different vision of the good life. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is not just telling beautiful stories about life and those who've chosen life and our own stories, but also by contending politically and saying, we are going to work our butts off to make abortion illegal, even if the country's not ready for it. Because if we can pull it off, those laws will function as a teacher. And over time, the country will become more and more pro-life. We have a silly tendency in America to assume that whatever's legal is good and whatever's illegal is bad. It's a very silly tendency we have, but young people in particular are very prone to think that way. So given that they will think that way, I'm going to contend politically to try to make abortion illegal so that their children will grow up in a society in which abortion is treated as illegal because it is immoral. Does that help? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. (laughs) Anyone else? Yes. Come on down. What's your name? Brenna. Brenna, good to meet you. Um, so I've actually seen, obviously, anytime I speak on landings on abortion, there's a lot of outrage from my peers. But I've actually seen a more common argument from people who do agree that it is actually murder. And the argument is made that the people who already are living are more important than the people who are not. And so when somebody says that to me, I found myself challenged to come up with an answer that isn't coming from my faith because I realize not everybody has my faith. So I guess my question is like, what would your answer be if you did not take it from a stance of faith? Right. Totally. So Brenda's question was responding to people who don't respect her position, who think she's coming at it from a Christian worldview and say that those who are already living are more important. We as a society have more vested interests in those who are already alive. They're contributing to society, whatever the reason is. And so therefore we should err on uh, tailoring the protection of life towards people already born. And if that means improving quality of life for those already born in order by sacrificing people who are unborn, then so be it, right? Well, uh, firstly, that's called circular reasoning. Here's why. They're saying those who are already living that was at least your language, um, should be protected, should be have their rights protected more than those who are not. Well, what's the assumption in that statement? That the unborn are not already living or that they're not already human. But that's called begging the question. Begging the question is a logical fallacy where you assume the very thing that you must prove in order for your argument to work in the first place, right? So does anyone have a little brother? Okay, uh, have you stopped beating him yet? Weeks ago. Yeah, see, good. Thank God. Now, see, the way that I've, very good. The way that I phrased that question puts her in a difficult position, right? If she says, yes, I've stopped beating him, what's she admitting? She used to beat him. If she says no, what's she admitting? She currently beats him. So what have I assumed? She beats him. What am I trying to prove? That she beats him. So I've assumed the very thing that I must prove in order for my argument to work in the first place. So when a pro-choicer says, um, we, people who are already living are more important than those who are not, they're assuming that the unborn is not already living or not already a human. But what do they have to prove in order for their argument to work in the first place? That the unborn is not fully living or not a full human already. So that's called circular reasoning, right? If unborn is not human, why not? Because the unborn is not human. Why not? Because they're not living. Why not? Because they're not. Okay, you're saying the same thing over and over again. It's circular reasoning. It's begging the question. It's assuming the very thing that you must prove for your argument to work. So that's how I would respond. And then I would say, you know, respectfully as we of course can, you know, here's why I'm pro-life. I'm pro-life because I believe in human equality. Do you believe in human equality, pro-choicer? And most will say, yes, all humans are, they, they, they're not going to say, no, I, I hate human equality, right? Their whole argument for abortion rights is based off of what? Women's equality. That's what the whole pro-choice position is based on. Of course, it denies equality to unborn women who are sacrificed on the altar of feminism. But again, that's a lecture for another time. So um, the assumption that they're making is that the unborn is not fully human. So we simply respond by saying, listen, I'm pro-life because I support human equality, meaning I want all humans to have human rights. And the science is clear that from the moment of conception, there's a distinct living and whole human being. And then any argument you offer in defense of abortion is actually an argument that can use to be justify killing you. Um, and so this is called trotting out the toddler. Anytime you hear an argument for abortion, or I call it the abortion BS filter. So you just take your abortion BS filter and you throw pro-abortion arguments into it and it strips it of its bigotry. And the way you do that is you repeat the pro-choicer's argument back to them, but ask them if they'd accept their own argumentation in defense of killing toddlers. Oh, what if the mother doesn't have any money and she's, you know, she's going to go broke or have to move out of her home? Okay, can we kill toddlers when they get expensive? Oh, no, no. 
Why not? Because they're humans. Oh. So the humanity you're granting to the toddler, you're denying to the unborn. So what's the fundamental question? What is the unborn? Now notice, I didn't cite any Bible verses to make my case, did I? But as Christians or as Protestants or Catholics, I'm affirming biblical truth nonetheless, which is that human beings have intrinsic dignity and value because they're created in the image of God. Does that help? Thank you. This is a common one that we probably hear all the time, but I just want to get your response to it. So I'll just be the first person for a second. So um, pro-lifer, if you think that abortion should be illegal, you do realize that women are going to die from dangerous back alley abortions, right? So would you say that we should still keep abortion legal so that it can be safe for women and that women won't right. die in back alley abortions like they did while abortion was illegal? Right. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. And this is a, a very popular argument you hear a lot. And it, it is used in a way, it's, a, it's used in a way to try to make the pro-choice position look more compassionate, right? We don't want these women dying through illegal abortions. So we need to keep it legal in order to cater towards the health and lives of, of women. By the way, before I give my full length response to that, let me just point out that that's blatant, bold-faced sexism. Here's why. And I know if you're, if you're pro-choice, you're like, what are you talking about? The assumption that if abortion is illegal, the only option women will have is to still seek out an illegal and dangerous back alley abortion is incredibly sexist because it tells women, you don't have enough intrinsic dignity and power of soul to embrace motherhood for the child you're already mother to, except the free help of local pregnancy resource centers who provide all of their resources for free because you're too weak. And I think this is the type of argument that Naomi Wolf would say is unworthy of feminism as she did with the belief that abortion imagery should not be shown in the public square because women will be too weak to face the reality of a choice that they have to make. The true feminist pro-woman perspective is to assume the best about the strength and dignity of women who, if faced with an unplanned pregnancy, will not endanger their own body by seeking out an illegal, dangerous abortion, but accept the resources sometimes of, of the government, and certainly of local Christian charities and faith-based organizations to care for the child that they're already a mother to. So I think it's a very demeaning view of women. Secondly, from a purely statistical standpoint, it's actually not true that millions or thousands, thousands of women were dying from dangerous back alley abortion clinics prior to its legalization in 1973. Not because I say so, okay, but because Bernard Nathanson, um, or I'm sorry, is it um, uh, Alan Guttmacher, or Bernard Nathanson, one of the two, um, admitted in his book, Bernard Nathanson, Aborting America. He was an abortionist, killed tons of babies, became a pro-life activist. And he said that him and other pro-abortion advocates and abortionists were responsible for creating figures out of pure fiction about how many women were dying from illegal abortions prior to 1973. And he says in his book, Aborting America, he said, we knew that it was a very small figure. It was in the, it was in the tens or hundreds in the whole country every year. But, but these numbers we set, tens of thousands, were very useful to forward our agenda against pro-life legislation. <laughs> so he I mean, we just fudged, we just lied. Yeah, we just, we just created lies about how many were such so a great hysteria in the country and support for pro-abortion legislation. So from a purely statistical standpoint, it's not true. Um, and we've also had uh, former Planned Parenthood abortionist medical directors prior to 1973, and I can get you these, these quotes and citations if you'd like, admitting that abortion was largely a safe procedure being performed prior to 1973 and it was usually being performed by physicians in good standings in their communities. So that's from former Planned Parenthood medical directors and abortionists saying, yeah, even before it was legal, most of the illegal ones were being done on the side in order to make more cash by physicians who knew what they were doing. So the other side is saying, yeah, it wasn't really that dangerous and not that many people were lying and we lied about how many people were dying. So just so you know all of that beforehand and you can read Bernard Nathan's book, Aborting America, if you want to dive deeper into that. Okay, that's the objective statistical response. Here's the moral response to the idea that undergird that statement, okay? I'll translate it for you first and then I'll explain what I mean. That position is tantamount to saying that because some people die trying to kill others, the state should make it safe and legal for them to do so. Let me repeat that statement. Because some people die trying to kill others, the state should make it safe and legal for them to do so. So who would be some people die? The mothers. Trying to kill others. Who's others? the unborn babies, the state should make it safe and legal for them to do so. So imagine this. Imagine a couple of bank robbers have been cruising throughout Knoxville, Tennessee, and they've successfully robbed two banks. Um, they haven't killed anyone yet, but they've robbed a lot of property and money. 
They attempt to rob a third bank. As they're escaping out the door with bags of cash, a law-abiding citizen with a concealed carry permit, which I hear is a little bit easier to get here than in California, where I'm from, <laughs> takes out his gun, shoots one of the bank robbers in the calf. Guy falls on the ground, starts bleeding out. The other bank robber leaves him there with the blood and the cash on the sidewalk, jumps into his getaway car and zips off. Okay, guys, listen. Ugh, we have a bank robber who's bleeding out and dying because he did something dangerous and immoral, uh, risking injuring others and himself. So here's the solution, guys. Listen, we need to legalize bank robbery because we have to protect bank robbers. They shouldn't be getting harmed. That's unnecessary. We can protect them as they break the law, steal your property and endanger their own lives. We can protect them by making it legal. Okay. Everyone goes, you stupid bigot, Seth, right? As soon as I test those same moral premises in a different thought experiment. But it's the same premise because mothers might get injured or harmed in the process of trying to kill their own unborn children is not a good argument to say that the state should make it safe and legal for them to do so. And if you really care about the health of women's bodies, you're not helping their health or lives by 100xing the numbers of abortions that are performed every year because many women are endangered in the process of legal abortions. And I can give you the stats for that as well. Of course, the House of Horrors incident that we're probably most familiar with is Kermit Gosnell, who had dried blood on the walls of his clinics, was snipping the spinal cords of infants who were accidentally born alive during their abortion and murdered multiple women in the process of their abortions. He just got caught. That happens all around the country. You won't hear that from mainstream media news sources, but if you follow pro-life blogs or conservative news sources, you'll find incidences on a weekly, if not bi-weekly basis of women being rolled out in stretchers who were significantly harmed or hemorrhaging in the process of their legal abortion. So this, this, this fake compassion of we care about the health and lives of women. Yeah, right. Because every time pro-lifers try to pass common sense legislation to make abortion safer for the mother, not even protecting the child, which is what our goal, but just making it safer for the mother, the ACLU and Planned Parenthood sue every time. So much for the health of the women you claim to care about. Spare me. And I could dive into more of that with the abortion pill, how that endangers the health of women, and how the pro-abortion movement hates the FDA safety regulations on the sale of the abortion pill, which are geared towards the protection of women's health. So much for women's health. But the fundamental flaw in that argument, we need to keep abortion legal because if it's made illegal, women will die from dangerous back alley abortion clinics, is the same logical fallacy of the pro-abortion left. Begging the question assuming the very thing that they must prove in order to make their argument in the first place. Because would they argue that we should legalize bank robbery to, to protect bankers? How about this one, school shootings? Oh my gosh, did you know some school shooters are shot by campus security or taken down in the process of trying to kill their classmates? Hey, shooters' lives matter too. We don't want their neck getting broken when they're pummeled by the campus security or worse yet, shot to be prevented from killing a classmate. So we need to legalize school shootings. Right? Because some people might die trying to kill others. So the state should make it safe and legal for them to do so. Right, pro-choicer? Does any pro-choicer apply their same moral premises in those different scenarios? No. But they do accept it in the case of abortion. So what have they assumed about the unborn? That they're not fully human and somehow don't deserve protection in our laws. But what do they have to prove for their argument to work in the first place? That same thing. Does that help? Thank you, guys. Hey guys, thank you for staying tuned in for uh, my lecture, Abortion is Genocide at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful for you. Share this episode with someone. As you know, my show is also available on YouTube at my YouTube channel, Seth Gruber, a voice for the unborn. Give us a subscribe at YouTube, the second largest search engine in the world. We want to reach more people there. You can also watch it there as well as watch the visuals that I had included in my PowerPoint slide presentation in the lecture. And you can share that with, with others as well. If you like this show and you benefited from uh, what we talk about here and the ideas we unpack to equip you to stand, consider becoming a patron of the show. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash unaborted. Check out our nine different tiers, each one giving you a perk, uh, access to me, access to live broadcast, Q&A, digital downloads, and a digital small group once a month and a lot more. So we really appreciate that. Go check that out. Go subscribe at YouTube. Give the show a rating and review at Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to hear me speak live and local or to book me for an event, go to sethgruber.com to learn more and join my newsletter. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week. I'm Seth Gruber and this is Unaborted.